Lawrence Livermore was in the news recently for conducting a nuclear fusion experiment that produced more energy than it took to initiate it. America's nuclear weapons leadership was on hand to announce this important national security milestone. But back in the day, the lab was conducting nuclear energy release on a slightly different scale. During the summer of 1957, America tested a number of nuclear devices at the Nevada test site. Nine were mounted on towers. Thirteen were lofted on balloons. One was launched by an aircraft. And the first underground test was performed. All of these tests were design concepts intended to miniaturize the nuclear explosive package. To go from this, the largest warplane ever made, dropping this, one of the largest bombs ever made, to this, slightly more agile combination, or this, getting the Navy involved, or even this, keeping the Army in the game, the Marines and Coasties having expressed no interest. So, what, when, where, why, and how did this thing end up at the Nevada test site? As to what, it's a naval gun turret from a United States Navy World War II heavy cruiser. As to when, it was installed during the spring of 1957, shown as the barbette, or foundation, the turret was mounted on. Here's the completed project with a fresh coat of silver paint. As to where, it is located in Yucca Valley, Area 2 of the Nevada test site. Situated next to the 2300 bunker complex, the gun turret was surrounded by three towers that mounted devices Diablo, Whitney, and Shasta, each less than a mile distant. As to where the lab obtained it, it came from right here off the spare turret slab at berth 15 of the then Mare Island shipyard. Starting in late 1942, the shipyard constructed replacement turrets for the cruisers in service at the time and carried on this secret program throughout the war. But why make replacements? Because the Japanese kept punching holes in our cruisers. Shown here is the USS Minneapolis after taking two torpedoes on the port side one of which exploded a magazine that nearly ripped her bow off. Another example is her sister ship, the USS New Orleans, who suffered a similar fate by actually having her bow blown off. Note, turret one, missing in this photo, will need to be replaced. Yet another example is the USS Pensacola, who suffered a fuel tank explosion that turned her into a Roman candle. Note those smaller holes above the larger one at the waterline? Those are American shells going out, not Japanese shells going in. All three of these, and a fourth that sank, were hit during the same engagement. All three of the ones shown survived the war and were returned to service thanks to the efforts of the Mare Island personnel. As to why the turret was installed, it served as a diagnostic station during the three tower tests mentioned before. The gun turret safely housed sensitive detectors used to measure the high energy light streaming out of each device and safely protected them from the blast wave that was going to arrive pretty fast from less than a mile away. By analyzing the increase in brightness, one could determine how closely the device performed compared to its design specifications or how much bang for the buck you got out of each device. As to how the turret got to the test site, first they shipped it from Maryland to Port Wainini, home of the Fighting Seabees and a duty station of my father, who served there in the 1960s. Then it was loaded onto some flatbed trucks and hauled through Los Angeles. Shown here is a stretch of the brand new Interstate 10. The valley in the background is Covina. But a closer look at the turret revealed something quite unexpected. 
an irregular welded patch in the rooftop armor plate, indicating the turret had been in action and repaired. The big questions now were, what ship had it come off of, and how had it been damaged? On even closer inspection, I found an important clue. It was stamped into the side armor panels at the location shown here. An inscription gives four lines of text. The top line is a blueprint number. The middle two lines refer to location. The last line is an assembly number, 117. The completed turret is an assembly of many parts. Next stop, the National Archives in San Bruno, California, where the fragments of documentation from the long since decommissioned Mare Island shipyard reside in old dusty boxes. There my colleague, Jerry Leslie, found a carbon copy of a letter sent in 1930 to the commandants of the Norfolk, Mare Island, and Puget Sound Naval Shipyards. The letter states that turret assembly number 126 to be installed in the heavy cruiser Chicago will arrive at Mare Island aboard the USS Vega. Also included for the USS Louisville building at Puget Sound is a box of parts for 8-inch triple mount assemblies 118, 117, and 120. We will now describe the combat actions of the USS Louisville that started the gun turret in the desert on its incredible journey. As you will see, the Divine Wind played a dominant part with the A6M-0 fighter cast in the lead role. By land or by sea, the A6M-0 was a deadly opponent. Introduced in 1940, this fighter literally outclassed everything in the Pacific theater when America entered World War II. Emphasizing agility, endurance, and firepower, this plane, in the hands of Japan's superbly trained pilots, was well suited to the samurai spirit of total offense. Initially deployed in numbers that overwhelmed local defenses, this lethal combination of man and machine secured for Japan the air superiority that allowed the third largest navy in the world to banish the first and second from the Pacific theater in a matter of months. The Zero's early dominance was eventually countered by evolving Allied tactics, resolve, and a fair amount of good fortune. The short but bitter carrier battles of Coral Sea and Midway were just warm-ups for the six-month meat grinder that was the Guadalcanal campaign. The near-run thing that was 1942 ended with the carrier air forces of both sides literally exhausted. Over that period, the loss of irreplaceable flight decks was no less disastrous to the Japanese war effort than the depletion of the cream of her elite pilot corps. From 1943 to mid-44, the Japanese Navy tried desperately to rebuild its carrier aviation forces to levels they had started the war with. But as the Japanese knew very well, they couldn't compete against U.S. industry. And over the next two years, the Americans had made up their early losses, and then some. This graph shows the number of flight decks available to each side at the end of 1941 and 42, and the number brought into service each year from 43 to 45. Admiral Yamamoto's words were indeed prophetic. I can run wild for six months. After that, I have no expectation of success. American aviation technology also advanced at a rapid pace, and new fighters like the outstanding Hellcat and Corsair now outclassed the Zero in everything except low-speed maneuverability. This graph shows the number of carrier aircraft that could sortie off of the flight decks just mentioned. But equally important as the number of planes brought to bear, new American pilots were trained by experienced combat aces, while veteran Japanese pilots had to fly until they died. By 1944, America's two-pronged approach to defeat the Japanese was in full swing, with the Navy and Marines slugging their way through the Central Pacific to secure island air bases from which the Army Air Corps could use its brand new B-29 airplane 
to begin a strategic bombing campaign against Japan's heavy industry and shipyards. This push climaxed with the Battle of the Philippine Sea, in which Japan's newly rebuilt air forces were obliterated in two days during the Great Marianas turkey shoot. The next objective was to cut off Japan from the oil that fed her war machine. The target chosen was the Philippines. To counter the invasion of the Philippines, Japan attempted to bring her still powerful surface forces into action. As usual, they devised a set of complicated plans involving maximum effort, deception, and exquisite timing. But the Battle of Leyte Gulf was again a dismal failure, and they ended up losing most of what was left of their navy. In desperation, the enemy turned to sacrifice to stem the inevitable tide. To secure the island of Luzon, amphibious landings were planned for Lingayen Gulf in early January 1945. The invasion forces, which were to proceed up the west side of the archipelago, would have to run a gauntlet to get there, as intelligence reported that over 250 enemy planes were still on the island's many air bases. We will now focus on two days during which these forces were attacked by kamikaze aircraft on January 5 and 6, 1945. Elements of Task Group 77, under the command of Admiral Jesse Ohlendorf, proceeded from Leyte Gulf to Lingayen Gulf, starting on New Year's Day in 1945. Proceeding in two formations of roughly equal force, each group consisted of a collection of escort carriers, old battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. The escort carriers, with their wooden flight decks and very flammable contents, were the primary targets for the Japanese. A typical example was the USS Macon Island. About the size of a cruiser, she wasn't any faster than the old battleships, but she had fairly long legs, and she did carry 28 aircraft. She also sported a collection of anti-aircraft guns to defend herself. The single 5-inch mount with an effective range of about six miles, might get off 10 rounds at a plane approaching at 200 knots. Radar directed, they could fire VT-fused ammo that could knock down a plane without actually hitting it. The 40 millimeter guns, with a shorter effective range but a higher rate of fire, had about a minute to engage a target, but if they did hit it, they would likely shoot it down. Many considered this to be the most effective anti-aircraft gun against kamikaze attacks. The last chance were the 20 millimeter crews, who couldn't open up beyond half a mile, leaving only 30 seconds to acquire and hit a target, with no guarantee they'd bring her down, even if they did. An escort carrier's best defense against air attack turned out to be her own aircraft. A typical air wing consisted of 20 Wildcat fighters and 8 Avenger torpedo bombers. Combat air patrols typically accounted for 60% of kamikaze losses. Note, we started the war with the Wildcat, a poor performer against the Zero, but we traded numbers to offset the advantage of the airframe. Of the battleships, the USS California, with Admiral Ohlendorf aboard, was the flagship of the task group. Commissioned in 1921, she was not very fast, nor could she go very far on a tank of gas. But she did sport 12 14-inch guns, and at 32,000 tons, she could dish it out and she could take it. Sunk at Pearl Harbor, she'd spent years being rebuilt and had only returned to battle in mid-44 with a new and impressive anti-aircraft battery. Among the van group, two of the heavy cruisers were the USS Louisville and her sister ship, the Portland, and they were real beauties. They were fast, they had long legs, and they were very lean. Their 8-inch guns also gave them a very serious bite. Built in the early 30s, the Louisville was known as the Lady Lou and also the Lucky Lou because despite serving in every theater since the outset of the war and even being hit by a torpedo that did not explode, she had only lost a few of her air crew up to this point in time. The Lady Lou and the Portland also had the best anti-aircraft gunnery crews in the entire task group because they had been in action since day one, while most of the other ships in the group had only been afloat for a year or two. Rounding out the screen were the destroyers, 
like the Fletcher-class USS Leutze. Her main job was anti-submarine defense, although she could pitch in on air defense as well. With such formidable defensive forces arrayed against it, and so few planes left with which to counter the next American thrust, kamikaze units adopted every trick to avoid combat air patrols and confuse radar. At Leyte Gulf, the high-altitude attack was most often employed. Approaching in small groups, from different directions above 20,000 feet, the planes pushed over at about 9 miles into a maximum speed power dive that ended up in an even steeper angle, carrying bombs and a full fuel load into the deck of a ship. However, the high-angle approach could be countered by the combat air patrol and radar-guided anti-aircraft fire from much of the task group. At Lingayen Gulf, the low-level attack was adopted. Now small groups, hugging the deck, would approach from different directions, through cloud cover, and especially from overland. When in gun range, they would split up and maneuver radically. The Zero, with a fighter pilot at the controls, was the very best at this. When they got close to a carrier, battleship, or cruiser, they would pop up and dive into the deck on final approach. For carriers, they would aim at planes on the deck or at the island. For battleships and cruisers, they would aim at the bridge. Attacks on destroyers and smaller ships went straight in and attempted to hit the hull at the waterline. They would also fly towards one ship and at the last moment turn quickly to crash into another nearby before its any aircraft guns could engage. Of course, if they were taking hits, they would attempt to crash into the nearest target of opportunity. A grim efficiency was realized in the early going that only encouraged expansion of the program. Here are the statistics of the first four months of the Kamikaze Corps. The numbers below each bar show the Kamikaze and normal bombing and torpedo attacks flown in a given month. Nearly 500 at Leyte, then about 200 a month in November, December, and January. The percentage of Kamikaze to normal attacks is given by the yellow bar. Starting in November, nearly 50% of all attacks were Kamikaze. The blue bar shows the percentage of kamikaze attacks that either hit or crashed close enough to a ship to cause damage and death, nearly or above 50% for the entire Philippine campaign. The orange bar next to it is the percentage of normal attacks that hit or damaged a ship, 3% or less for every month. These were not tactics adopted by choice. These were tactics adopted by necessity. Unlike most Japanese war records, the kamikaze records are largely intact and are held in reference at the Asakuni War Shrine in Tokyo, Japan. Using these primary sources, along with deck logs, action reports, and personal accounts from Allied ships, we will now reconstruct the kamikaze attacks against the USS Louisville on January 5 and 6, 1945. The translated records show that on January 5, the Japanese Navy sent 17 Zero fighters and the Army sent four VALs and three Oscars to attack the task group 75 miles west of Luzon. The attacking planes sortied from several airfields north of Manila. Just before sunset on January 5, three planes came in on the deck and were engaged by the 5-inch battery of the screen. The first plane, a Zero, was shot down by the Portland. The second plane, likely another Zero, was shot down close aboard the Aussie destroyer Arunta. The third plane, another Zero, closed in on the loose port bow, all guns that could bear blazing away like fury, actually hitting it and starting it on fire, but it plowed on relentlessly. The loose skipper ordered hard a port to minimize his target area but it was too late. And the Lady Lou finally craps out, taking one squarely on the chin. Minutes before the attack began, two destroyers left the inner screen, leaving a big hole on the left side of the formation, which may have been exploited. All three planes used the destroyers to screen themselves from the anti-aircraft fire of the heavy ships. On being hit, the Lou sheared out of column to port, several ships reporting her out of control. The destroyer Leutze followed to assist. The butcher's bill was extensive. Captain Hicks, 
Six officers and 56 men were wounded, mostly with flash burns of the first and second degree. Miraculously, only one man was killed. The damage to the ship was also extensive. The number two turret was largely destroyed, with the bridge, Mark IV radar, and 5-inch director all badly damaged. Some members of the crew were more fortunate than others. Many of the injured were among the gun crews. Here we show half of the 20mm personnel. Two members, Enrico Trota and Pappy Blaylock, were extremely lucky. Because these two were below decks having dinner when the attack began. Had Enrico been at his action station, number 4 20mm mount just below turret 2 on the port side, he also would have been badly injured or killed. By this point, my research had answered my two foremost questions, with more than a few surprises found along the way. But I had noticed something odd in the movie footage of the attack on the ship. So I requested that the National Archives send the film of the attack to our Atomic Test Film Restoration Group at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They produced a high-resolution digital copy that revealed a unique moment in the history of combat photography. The attacking plane is closing on the Louisville's port bow in a shallow dive. The pilot actually got out of the cockpit and ran across the wing. He made it to the end of the wing, crouched as if to spring, and popped his parachute. But as he tumbled, it failed to fully deploy. Watch the airplane. But a jumping kamikaze? Common lore suggests they did not even carry parachutes. In fact, all pilots were assigned a parachute, but they mainly used them for seat cushions. According to Saburo Sakai, one of Japan's few remaining aces, no fighter pilot of any courage would ever allow himself to be captured by the enemy. It was completely unthinkable, and yet this one jumped. Furthermore, I contend that this was a deliberate premeditated act. Consider, one, the plane's in a shallow dive with wings level, an easy target for the ship's guns. Two, the plane is coming in almost on the bow, minimizing the number of guns that could fire at it. And three, it's flying very slowly. The Zero could reach over 300 knots in a dive. I've inserted a red line indicating the path a pilot would take to hit the bridge. You can just see the pilot leaving the cockpit. The landing gear is also dropping, probably from getting hit earlier in the attack. At this point, the pilot has reached the end of the wing, 18 feet from the cockpit. My brother, who jumps out of perfectly good aircraft for fun and profit, assures me that the plane had to be going less than 80 miles an hour for the pilot to have reached this point. Here, the plane is descending and departing from the target glide slope and beginning to side slip since no one is at the controls. Note, the gear is now fully extended, indicating that the aircraft is indeed an A6M Zero fighter. Impact is imminent, but the plane is not going to hit the bridge, but rather the number two turret starting it on its incredible journey. The pilot is still tumbling, and apparently his chute is starting to deploy. Old parachutes like this one were designed to deploy at or above 150 miles an hour. Used as a seat cushion, it's likely he did not pack it very carefully. And if he had just hung on for a few more seconds, well, perhaps he just wanted to admire his handiwork. We'll never know. Another personal account, this time from ship's surgeon, Lieutenant Commander William Johnson, who was at a forward aid station with orders to first check on Admiral Chandler if the ship got hit. He exited onto the starboard side of the forecastle deck just aft of turret one and immediately came across two sailors who were kicking the crap out of a Japanese pilot. The pilot was dead, having been slammed into the ship's side 
by his parachute that had hung up on the rightmost gun of turret two. The good doctor, not wishing to see the body defiled any further, whipped out his sheath knife, cut the shrouds, and ordered the seamen to toss the fellow overboard. Despite the damage, the Louisville led her division in fire support missions the next day, under sporadic air attack, only to have the kamikazes return with a vengeance at sundown. Japanese records indicate 28 kamikaze planes attacked the task group inside Lingayen Gulf on January 6. The Navy sent 17 Zero fighters, two Judy dive bombers, and one Jill torpedo bomber. The Army sent four Val dive bombers and two Oscar and two Nick fighters. The California, with Admiral Ohlendorf aboard, was the first ship to get hit by a Zero. She was also hit by a five-inch round from one of her overzealous escorts, both starting large fires. Forty-four men were killed and 155 were wounded. The California, built at Mare Island, stayed in the fight until the amphibious landings were completed. The light cruiser Columbia was up next, with an Oscar scoring on her fantail. More than 20 men jumped overboard to escape the massive fires, but 24 men were killed in action, and 97 were wounded. Then another Zero streaked in from starboard, likely heading for the Portland. Then executed an extremely hard left bank, and the Lady Lou is hit again. An encore of death and destruction. Ted Waller, 40mm gun director aboard the Portland just ahead, had a ringside seat for this one. The attack came in on the deck from the beaches with no radar warning. Five-inch gun captain Paul Franz stated they were buzzing around like big angry bees. The Lou again sheared out of column to port, followed by the Loitza. Destroyers Kimberly and Izard also stood by to pick up men in the water from the Lou and Columbia, then rejoined the task group outside Lingayen Gulf. This image, taken from the battleship Colorado, shows the California being hit. Note, the heavy smoke from the main battery and anti-aircraft guns of nearly every ship. This smoke effectively screened the attacking planes. Casualties were extremely heavy. Rear Admiral Theodore Chandler, Commander, Cruiser Division 4, six officers and 22 men of the Louisville were killed in action. Six other officers and 49 men were wounded. Most of the wounds were due to shrapnel. Most of the dead from burns, many of the third and fourth degree. Ten of these were unable to be identified and listed as missing in action. The damage to the ship was also extensive. The plane carried a bomb under each wing that exploded on two deck levels. On the signal bridge, radar and radio rooms were destroyed. Nearly all radio antenna were damaged and many specialists were casualties. Radio man Harry Minton was a lucky man this day. The plane piled up against the forward stack, dishing it severely. Admiral Chandler was also on this deck level when the plane hit. The other bomb destroyed anti-aircraft mounts and sprayed the area with lethal fragments. Pappy Blaylock was killed here. The Lady Lou staggered back to her feet, and after regaining the task group, Admiral Ohlendorf decided his former flagship had had enough. Next morning, she was ordered west to operate with the carrier task group, where she buried her dead. She then escorted a group of cripples to Leyte Gulf, where she landed her wounded, and under the command of her XO, William McCarty, she began the long trip home to Mare Island. After her departure, the beatings continued with no improvement in morale. Over the next 10 days, 67 ships were damaged and 24 sunk by kamikaze aircraft. Highlighted here are the ships in the van group that were hit. The plucky destroyer Loitza, after a few close calls, ended her combat career at Okinawa, again at the hands of a kamikaze pilot. The Louisville spent nine weeks at Mare Island to repair her structural, ordnance, electrical, and fire damage. The yard had to write the damage report, since her few remaining officers had been standing watch on watch for almost a month. The crew were granted two weeks' leave in two waves. 
40 never returned, preferring arrest to returning to action. The damaged turret was replaced with a spare on hand built by the yard. Ralph Hopkins, who joined the ship in March, said it only took a day to swap out the old and in with the new. The new turret was built without rivets or bolts, as seen in the photo here. Welding techniques had indeed come a long way since 1930. The damaged turret was repaired and put on the spare turret slab, but it was not needed before the war ended, and it sat on the dock for 12 years before Irv Woodward got the bright idea to haul it out to the desert to face nuclear fury. Sixty years later, it's still there, locked in time, likely to remain so forever. And so we pay tribute to the USS Louisville and all who served aboard her. She served her country long after her last salvo was fired. To all who go in harm's way and those who support them, thank you. Many people aided me in this research, particularly ship's historian Don Montgomery and my colleague Jerry Leslie. Don's exhaustive collection of photographs formed much of this presentation. Paul Kogan of the National Archives and Dennis Kelly were also invaluable by providing crucial documentation. Translators Akitaka Nishimura and Hiroshi Saito were also crucial as well. And my laboratory colleagues Richard Ward, Don Smith, and Jim Moya played substantial roles. Louisville Crewman provided rare insights. Mike Marino, Harry Minton, and Ralph Hopkins. Access to the gun turret and its history at the test site was greatly facilitated by three gentlemen in particular, Chuck Costa, Ernie Williams, and Nelson Cochran. Here we are on the day I inspected the gun turret and found much of the evidence that led to its true identity. A true band of brothers, I will cherish my memories of them all the days of my life. But three crewmen, who I had the distinct honor to correspond with, deserve special mention. Ted Waller, Paul Franz, and Enrico Troda. Fair wind and following seas. To learn more about the mystery of the gun turret in the desert, consult my technical report or the August 2017 issue of Sea Classics.